guess we'll get started here. Welcome to our the last in our series of ISDS Computer Science Colloquia, focusing on the risks of the Internet of Things to society as cyber stuff penetrates all kinds of aspects of previously cyber-free human physical control and factory systems and uh, what what can go wrong. So we've had a couple of speakers talking about different sort of attack perspectives and today I'm honored to have Dave Safford, a friend and former colleague from IBM who's now running uh, security and stuff for uh, GE uh, and their IoT work, uh, talking about the defense. <coughs> so some things about Dave, the uh, senior principal engineer for security at GE, uh, is a Linux kernel maintainer for trusted keys. Um, and back at uh, IBM, he headed the ethical hacking group for a while. Uh, as well as did a lot of work in trusted computing. And uh, some ideas he and I kicked around around the turn of the century led to uh, three different PhD theses, only one of them here, and neither of them, you know, ours. So that's kind of a neat thing. Um, and also, there's probably some kind of day that had been a, um, a submarine diving officer in the Navy, so maybe there's some kind of Army Navy thing. <laughs> Anybody, anybody uh, have a rivalry against Texas A&M? <laughs> <laughs> okay, well that being said, Dave is going to talk about hardware-based control system integrity. So this is going to be interesting. Um, everything technical that can go wrong has gone wrong so far. The microphone doesn't work, so if I'm not talking loud enough, just kind of wave and I'll, I'll try to talk a little bit louder. The other thing is, of course, I'm running Linux on my system with my own private kernel. And it doesn't seem to like to, to project on both my laptop and screen. So I have no idea what's showing up there. So <laughs> I'll, I'll try to you know, remember what it was and, and, and talk to it. Uh, a little bit of background. I, just, I was for 19 years with, with uh, IBM, <coughs> T.J. Watson, and, and, and old colleagues with uh, Sean and Charles Palmer at, at Al back there. And recently, about 10 months ago, um, I was very excited to be offered a position at General Electric. Um, and the reason I was so excited is the work that I want to show you that, that's actually been, been uh, led by uh, our, our, our uh, uh, CEO himself, Jeff Immel, actually directed this work. So this is a, one of these rare cases where you have a uh, um, uh, a CEO that actually gets it and understands security and actually wants it to happen. So this is definitely a defensive talk, not an offensive talk. Uh, I've had lots of fun on the offensive side before. I wrote my first ethical hacking, published ethical hacking paper back in 1985. Um, and, and so it's been quite a while on, on, the, on the penetration side of things. But ultimately it just, that just became too easy and, and I turned the the much, much greater challenge of actually trying to stop the bad guys from getting in. And, and that's a lot of what this talk will be about. Um, as I said, uh, I'm with GE right now. It's not really an internet of things, sort of, yes and no. It's an industrial internet of things. And so we don't do the things like meters, smart meters on your homes. Uh, we actually generate 50% of the world's electricity. Um, we have distribution of roughly 50% of the electricity over grids is on GE slash uh, our newly acquired Alstom group. Um, and, and so we're on that end. We're on the, the infrastructure side, the critical infrastructure side of the problem. It's similar to the IoT in that everything that we do is embedded. In other words, you're not people you know, controlling a jet engine, controlling a locomotive, controlling um, a generator, a wind turbine sitting there at a, at, a, at a keyboard, it's all embedded, it's all running uh, automatically. So let me see if I can make this thing work. Start from here. Um, <laughs> let's get one slide. The one slide had just pretty pictures of all the things that we build at GE. As I mentioned, locomotives, jet engines, on, on roughly 50% of the airplanes, uh, commercial airplanes flying out there, a lot of military. Um, uh, wind turbines. Um, and uh, uh, gas turbines um, powering most of the electric plants. Um, a lot of large industrial critical infrastructure. Um, and the area of interest are the embedded controllers. Now, 
And again, these are not these small Internet of Things controllers. These are big industrial controllers. These are um, some of them shown here. This is the uh, RXI models, which are current models that are out there. Showing you have a, 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 a gas generator uh, with a local controller, and it talks um, to a t uh, 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 another level controller. It ultimately talks up to Prefix Cloud. This is our digital industrial type of architecture that we're moving to, where uh, rather than having these things air gapped or not connected to the internet, we're connecting them to the internet. We're sending the data from these physical devices all the way up into our in, in Prefix Cloud, and so it's a digital industrial combination. Uh, and obviously the question you ask yourself, if we're going to be hooking this critical infrastructure up and we have embedded control systems and we're hooking them up deliberately to the internet, what are the security issues? How do we, how do we protect them? And just a little bit foreshadowing, the real answer is, the interesting thing is that hooking them up to the internet makes them more secure, not less secure. And I'm going to substantiate that because it's a counterintuitive uh, result. Um, looking at the typical industrial control system for this type of generator, uh, we actually have a, a series of different levels of control. These are real-time embedded, these are real-time systems. We have a, you know, um, these things running at, at you know, 5, 10,000 RPM, uh, sometimes higher, and, uh, and the control system for them must be suitably real-time. So that puts a lot of constraints in what we have there. We can't put a general purpose operating system in there. We can't take time out to do you know, cryptographic calculations and things like that. These things are working with time constants that are in, in microseconds, milliseconds, seconds at the very highest level within a plan. And, and so we have a hierarchy of controllers that start are more complex and slower down to the very small controllers that are very, very fast. The problem is we have to secure all of them. Um, and then, so somebody was asking what keeps me awake at night. Um, this was actually asked of, of uh, Admiral uh, Rogers, uh, who is the head of the military head of the National Security Agency uh, at, at this recent, uh, this year's uh, RSA conference uh, back in February. And they, they asked him, what keeps you awake at night? And what are the top three things? And he said the very first thing that keeps him awake at night is the question of when, not if, there's going to be a cyber attack on our electric grid, our critical infrastructure. Um, and there's plenty of examples of being worried about that. Uh, for example, the NSA themselves are supposedly the ones that implemented Stuxnet. Stuxnet was a, a tour de force in the hacking community. Um, because it went in and attacked the Iranian centrifuges, despite the fact that the Iranian centrifuges and their control were completely air-gapped. They had no connection at all um, to the internet or to any external network. Completely isolated systems. And uh, what they found was that even though they're air-gapped, something, somebody still has to get data into them for control messages. In other words, updates, uh, parameter changes, controls, there still has to be a data path for that. And if there's not a wire, then there's something else that can do that data path. In this case, it was thumb drives. And so the attacking malware just was carried along with uh, compromised thumb drives. And so the air gap essentially was not at all effective at protecting the systems. And in the past, that was the major Thing that all of the cons, you know security consultants said, well, as long as you're air gap, there's no problem. You can have anything you want on the inside because there's no way they can get to you. Well, Stuxnet basically proved that completely false. The second one was the uh, Russian attack on the Ukraine electric grid. This was back in December <laughs> last year, um, and this one was interesting because again, it's a nation state. Um, but the most interesting thing was that this was. Um, a shot across their bow, essentially, it was a, it's a saying that we can be destructive. It's not just that we can turn you off and you flip the switch back on. They actually wipe every single PC's hard disk, every controller's hard disk, and of all the uh, lowest level controllers, those ones that were at the, down, you know, the bottom of the picture, the, you know, the microsecond level control systems, they bricked the firmware on every one of those devices. And by bricking the firmware, 
that means that that device could not be repaired on site. They actually had to take it off site to fix them. They couldn't replace them because they were actually about 20 years old and nobody made them anymore. So they were <coughs> severely degraded. They actually had to run their switching uh, units, their distribution units manually um, for many months until those, <coughs> those repairs could be occupied. So what we are now is in controls, in critical infrastructure controls, we're in the era of nation state cyber warfare, okay? This is a huge change from the original script kiddies, from the financial hackers, from um, industrial espionage, and other things that have come before. We are seeing real world practical cyber warfare attacks going on now. And being from GE, I'd really rather it not be GE equipment that gets, that gets compromised. So, uh, it was funny, I was looking in the bookshelf, uh, and, and they actually had a copy, you actually have a copy of the orange and, and red and blue books yes. in, in the bookshelf. So the original orange book um, goes way back. It was the original way that, that the Department of Defense uh, did threat analysis of saying how secure does a system have to be to resist the various level attacks. And they had, basically, they, they, uh, they categorized the threats um, according to uh, levels. And at the lowest level would be something like, you know, a, a just a general person, a script kitty, doesn't really understand, all the way up through the threat level seven, uh, which represents a nation state. In other words, one of their competitors. And the risk is how serious is this? I mean, it's, for example, okay, does the web page just not load and nobody really cares? Or do they shut the electric grid off in the entire United States? Or do people die? And when we look at the Ukraine and, and, and these other attacks, we're in the critical infrastructure and nation state attacks. So we are in the absolute worst case scenario according to the, in, according to the original orange book and the following uh, common criteria. The common criteria, uh, the original orange books actually referred to them as A, B, and C, you know, kind of like grades. Um, <laughs> and A was good and, and C was not so good. Um, the common criteria refers to them as assurance levels, and EAL-7 is the very, very highest assurance level, and it requires things like actual proof of correctness and very strange things that Sean was all about, having actually done the first one of these um, back at uh, IBM. So we're firmly now in critical infrastructure, we're firmly in this EAL-7 ballpark. Uh, that is the threat model that we have to be able to understand. Um, and so what does this mean? And, and if you go and you look at, at Orange Book and Common Criteria and some of the other related standards, there are a series of things, what they call defense in depth, which is, you know, you know called for in this type of serious threat environment. Uh, and this starts at the bottom uh, and hardware and, and it goes up. It's not, there's not any one piece of technology you can do it. Like some people say, oh, put a firewall on it, that'll solve your problems. No, not at the detail. <coughs> seven level attack, you have to start with secure hardware. You have to have um, the uh, a, a processor, the CPU itself that has certain security features. You have to have uh, additional hardware coprocessors, things like the trusted platform module. Um, you have to have firmware that controls the boot that is protected in some way. And I can get into a little bit more details on that. I hope I actually show you this. Um, so you've heard these by <coughs> terms such as secure boot, trusted boot, uh, encrypted boot, and I'll talk a little bit more about those. Um, then your operating system has to be trusted. And, and by trusted, this can actually go back to the old uh, uh, multi-level security type operating systems or integrity-oriented operating systems. But the point is the operating system has to take advantage of the security hardware, it has to use it to isolate the different levels <coughs> of sensitivity, such as you plug in an untrusted thumb drive, the operating system say that's an untrusted thumb drive and I will not let you do certain things from it. Uh, so it should track the integrity and, and sensitivity levels for the information. And on top of that, uh, you also need secure networking. So. In the past, with these industrial control systems, they said, we're, you know, air-gapped, we don't care. We'll just run unencrypted packets, 
uh, across the network. We won't authenticate anything. We won't do any access control. We won't do any encryption. We'll just send the packets back and forth. And, and at those very low level, you know, those millisecond level networking packets, that's still true today. And that has to change, and that's part of what we're changing. We no longer can assume that, that we have a secure network. This may seem obvious, but convincing people of that have been doing it this way for you know 30 years it can be kind of difficult. Um, there are other network services that we need. We need an overall infrastructure for doing things like authentication uh, information, PKI uh, infrastructures. Um, we need things like attestation service, which I'll talk about. We need things like uh, updates, and not just updates, but we need secure updates. Um, Actually, the main operating system have been doing a much better job on secure updates. Now, I think most of the major ones now currently will have signed updates that, that are, in fact, authenticated and, and done automatically. But um, we need to be doing this across our entire level of control systems, which it gets much harder. When you have a little tiny microcontroller that's doing your, your real-time uh, uh, microsecond uh, packet uh, handling, um, those devices typically don't have the ability to do actual uh, signed updates currently, so we need to actually, you know, raise the bar on them. Uh, secure updates, remote attestation. Uh, to me, this is the kind of the fundamental thing. I hope to hope to show a demo of this computer and projector will will uh, uh, work for us here. But um, this is where I was talking about the the network connection actually being the, the salvation, not the, not the not problem. Um, in those systems um, that were air-gapped, that were hacked, um, the air-gap did not stop the attack from, from propagating, but it did stop the ability for the actual owners of them to tell that their systems had been hacked. There was no return path of data because it was air-gapped. And that's the, that's the uh, uh, you know, it's an unacceptable problem. In this thing, in, in this approach, we want the hardware device, like a trusted platform module chip, in hardware to be able to communicate to our central cloud from all of our devices and prove to them continuously that they have or have not been hacked. I mean, only if we have that type of feedback can we tell, not if, but when somebody has broken in, when somebody has changed our firmware, and we can actually go and, and, and fix it. So is, is this awareness, this, this knowledge and understanding, this visibility into the control systems that we think is absolutely critical, and it has to be hardware rooted. If it's rooted in software, the attacker will change the software and it will no longer do its function. So the basic, that, that's a whole level. And this is not a, a one level, it's not a one piece of software, it's the entire system. It's the hardware of all of our control systems, it's the opposite boot time, the software, the operating systems, all these different network services, we have to change all of these. And this is a huge task. <clears throat> a little bit of, of trying to clarify some of the nomenclature. Uh, you've, you've probably heard a lot of these. A lot of these technologies actually started on either laptops or cell phones. Um, but there, there are three different but related things we can do at boot time with a hardware root of trust. Um, the first thing we can do is trusted boot. In trusted boot, what we're going to do is we're going to measure all of the firmware and software levels that are going in all the way up to the operating system and put that measurement into a hardware chip, the trusted platform module. We don't stop anything. We don't judge it. We don't say it's good or bad. We just measure it. And then this chip can sign these measurements and send it off to somebody else, your management, send it up to the cloud. And the cloud then can look at it and say this is good or bad. So we keep the device very simple. Uh, but we also, by putting this function in the hardware, we make sure that it cannot be compromised. Even if your operating system is completely compromised, the worst they can do is not let the attestation go through, in which case you already know that there's something wrong because you have not received a valid attestation. So that's the trusted boot. A second type of boot is called secure boot. And this is the type, uh, most of recent PCs, you know, with the, uh, you know, you uh, have seen with UFI Secure Boot. What this has is there's in a hardware protected area of the flash, there's a key or a set of keys, certificate hierarchy for keys. 
And anything that's going to be booted has to be signed by one of those keys. And if what you try to boot is not signed by one of those keys, it actually stops the boot at that point. It does not let it continue. So it's, it's different than trusted boot in that um, it stops things. It's also uh, different because everything has to be signed. So in one model, there, there are trade-offs. So there are advantages and disadvantages. The first one, you don't have to have a signing infrastructure. All you have to do is have, have a TPM chip. Uh, the second one, you have to have a signing infrastructure. The first one is permissive. The second one is restrictive. But they're actually complementary. In, in Linux, we're, we've actually combined these two. It's not an either or. It's not a, a, a dichotomy here. It's you really want both because there are advantages and disadvantages to both of them. <coughs> Third uh, thing that you can do at boot time is actually have uh, support for encryption. So what you can say here is that everything on your primary storage, your programs and everything else can be encrypted and integrity verified um, such that um, people cannot do offline attacks against it. They can't change anything with, with, uh, without knowing the key. And um, uh, this can be done in a number of different ways. You can tie it into a secure boot type architecture. You can easily tie it into a trusted boot architecture. Uh, at GE, we've been actually tying the encrypted boot in with the TPM chip with the trusted boot architecture. And what this says is that, the T in this case, the TPM chip holds the actual encryption key for the rest of the disk, for the entire disk. And it will not release that key unless the operating system that we're booting is the correct operating system. So it actually looks at it and says, that's not right, I'm not giving you the key. Or, okay, that's right, we booted the right thing. So right off the bat, we can defeat attacks like putting a thumb drive in to boot up, you know, um, uh, a version of Linux or something to hack, hack the disk. You can't do that because the disk's encrypted and the TPM won't release the key because you've booted a different operating system. So these are our three fundamental but related building blocks. Um, there's actually one layer under this that all of these assume, and that is that you have some protection on, on the boot itself. So, um, and there are a lot of different ways of doing this, but obviously you don't want a, a, a root attacker remotely coming in and changing the software and turning these things on or off, for example. I mean, obviously the boot, the initial bootstrap that does the trusted boot or secure boot or encrypted boot has to be protected from attack some way, and that also requires hardware. So there's an interesting interaction between the hardware support for these. We can do some of them with trusted boot, but there also has to be in some, we can do some things with secure boot, but there has to be a protection layer under it. Um, and, and this is actually specified pretty nicely by, by a, a NIST standard that uh, Charles Palmer actually helped write, the PIPS uh, SP800-147, um, talks about protected boot. And there are a lot of different mechanisms. It doesn't matter which mechanism you use. You can do everything from actually having the bootstrap and ROM inside the CPU chip. A lot of the uh, embedded uh, system on a chip uh, uh, processors actually do this. They have an embedded uh, uh, first page, first sector of boot that is actually in ROM and cannot be changed. Uh, uh, another approach is to have an, an, you know, a portion of flash in which uh, is not writable. Um, the, the processor protects that section from being written to, and there's a hardware protection for that. So, it, you know, even uh, malicious software or privileged remote attacker can't change it. But somehow you have to have these anchored in hardware. So, here's our primary, you know, foundational element is getting some hardware in there that can provide us uh, one or more of these, you know, critical uh, foundational uh, uh, services. Um, this is also the longest lead time. Uh, it typically is two to three years to take a new control system from the drawing board to, to product. And this is what gates, you know, that. Fortunately, um, um, well, the other thing is I, I work in research. I can't make any product announcements. They, they, you know, shoot me if I actually try to say anything about products. Um, but I can say that we've kind of got this one covered. Um, what I'd like to try to do is, is do an integrity demonstration of these things because uh, I think it doesn't really, people don't really understand how powerful these techniques are unless they see it. What I have is I actually have, this laptop has a TPM, um, and 
Uh, it has Linux running. It has integrity measurement architecture running in Linux. So I have um, actually in this case a trusted boot and an encrypted boot. Uh, I don't have a secure boot. Um, and I have a TPM and the TPM locks the key uh, and the TPM also can report the measurements to Prix Cloud where somebody else can monitor it and, and, and show that. And I have absolutely no idea if I'm going to be able to show this. Um, what we should see, let me show you what we should see and then, then, then I can uh, go back, is so this actually, um, actually on my laptop I have Predix running. I have both the client side and the server side running on the one laptop. Uh, it's uh, done with the same Predix technology so I could just as easily be running this service that you see here in the cloud. Um, you know, I'm just running here locally so I don't have to have a network connection. Um, and what it's showing here is actually the integrity status of the entire laptop itself. So I'm watching itself and attesting to itself, which is a little bit strange. But, but, um, but this is what you can see. So for example, it's a very simple display. Green means is good. You know, green means that we've everything that's been run fits our policy. There's nothing unsigned, nothing uh, <coughs> badly signed, and nothing done with signed with a key that's not a valid key. And the weird hex numbers at the bottom are the proof of the signature of the TPM is actually matches what was reported. So nobody's trying to tamper with the uh, measurement. So the actual integrity value comes from the TPM chip, and the reported integrity value is derived from the entire list that was signed. But it's actually validated so far at this point 1,019 files. So this, the trusted boot has measured everything up to the operating system, including the kernel and unit RAM FS, and IMA has measured every file after that. So we've got a complete root of trust all the way from hardware all the way up to every single application that's been run and there have been zero integrity errors. And this runs continuously. Every time you run a new application, it validates. Um, the uh, second part of the demo is actually take a root privilege process. So I just log in as root. You know, I don't care how the attacker breaks <coughs> in. I assume that they're going to get in. I assume that they're going to get root privilege. Because that's, you know, we're in that, that uh, threat, threat scenario right now. The question is, what can they do? And with a root shell, I can try to run something ex uh, an executable that's not signed. It will not let me. As root, it will say, even tells even root, you cannot run that executable. Uh, if it has an invalid si signature, same thing, you cannot run that executable. It will give me a permission denied, and it will also report me <laughs> to the attestation. And I can't stop that as attestation because it's signed by the hardware TPM. So realistically, your only uh, way of executing code is finding a vulnerability in the signed code and uh, right. basically so, um, replacing your code, with, uh, replacing it with... Uh, so this current, um, some of the assumptions of, of this particular trusted operating system, I mean, there are a lot of different ways you can do this, and we're working with other vendors. It's not, Linux is our reference architecture. Um, with the Linux IMA, it's... Uh, it's looking for the integrity of the persistent image. So in other words, if you in memory can take over an existing process and stay entirely within the data segments and don't ever write anything to disk, we will not see it. If, however, you try to change anything, so you're persistent, in other words, you survive a reboot, you would have to commit that somewhere's disk. And at that point, we would, uh, on a reboot, be able to detect it. Even would you check for newer files as well? Ah, okay. So I'm simplifying a lot of things here. We've been working on um, IMA for, gosh, a long time, <laughs> many years. And we actually have a policy. And you, the policy can dictate what you measure, what you appraise. So measure just means you, keep, you, you take a hash and you store it and you report it. Mm -hmm. You let it go. Appraise means it has to be digitally signed, and you can you can add keys so I can say okay it's going to be uh, Ubuntu and GE for example. You control what keys can go in in a secure way, uh, but then if you say appraise, it has to be appraised, and if not, it will be failed and reported. Um, the other thing is you can designate I don't care for files. 
And you can do this based on the file. You can do it both the object and the subject, subject and object control. Mm -hmm. So I can say you as a user process on here can read that all you want. I don't care. But if you're root and you're trying to run that, it has to be signed. So you can construct these policies. And we've constructed a policy that <coughs> works well in several different environments. We have a policy that works well in the cloud. We have a policy that works well in our embedded control systems. So is that uh, SLinux based or replaces uh, SLinux? It's complementary to SE Linux. Uh, uh, for those that don't know, there the um, in Linux there's the there's a mandatory access con access control framework and <coughs> uh, called LSM Linux Security Module Framework, and you can load a different set of mandatory access control modules. There's AppArmor, SE Linux, Smack, um, Yama, Tamayo. Uh, I forget all, all, all right, right. the yeah, other ones. Lots of different ones. And you can pack and, and, and load them. The mandatory access control goes back to the original MLS type of design. You label objects. So I can say that this executable is, is, is able to work on secret you know, documents, and this one's not. And, and you can control what they can do. You can have a very complex policy. The integrity policy is a separate policy from those. Uh, but it's actually been designed that if the uh, LSM policy chooses, it can also ask the integrity, tell me the integrity of the system, and it can change its mandatory access, access control labels based on oh, integrity, <laughs> which is actually, so this was you know, done with the NSA and Stephen Smalley and the team way back when, these interactions. So it can be independent and completely policy controlled, and it can be taken advantage of by the mandatory access control. The, uh, um uh, adding uh, a past integrity check, failed integrity check, or has an integrity check, as uh, uh, an extra S Linux label is, is quite interesting. Right, Th that's exactly. So, and, and, and we actually tested this. Um, they've not chosen to actually use this so far because it's you know, hard enough for, to get a good SE Linux policy working on something as complex <coughs> as your desktop. Uh, for an embedded control system, it's much simpler. We have a small number of applications. It's a relatively constrained environment. We're not there's not a user sitting there trying to you know play games or do things like that. So it's a much much simpler environment. Now here's the fun one. In the demo, I actually uh, said what happens if they break the TCB. So in this case, I actually put a backdoor into the kernel, <laughs> and the backdoor in the kernel tries to clean out any failures, integrity failures, out of the measurement list. Okay. So you notice that, that my unsigned and invalid signature flags went away because they were able to manipulate the list, which is actually normally a TCB controlled element, the kernel controlled element. But you notice that they can't. Even a privileged TCB program like the kernel cannot do this because the hardware TPM says, huh, -uh, that's not the list I signed. And so we actually turn it red because not only have they attempted to compromise the system, but they actually have succeeded in compromising the system. Now, this system is, 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 um, is toast. That one needs to be shut down and isolated. Um, so in, in that case, uh, what happens? The system shuts itself down, and it's as though there was a successful attack until somebody cleans up the situation? Or Again, that's a policy thing that you can choose what you want to do. You can say upon that, um, we can externally uh, put it on a remediation network. We go and tell the switch, go do this. Because this is coming from a Predix cloud side. Mm -hmm. The cloud can go in and manage downward. And it can manage the firewall and, and the various networking switches. Um, the other thing, internally inside the box, you can choose to have a policy that would say, please shut down. <coughs> but we can't guarantee that, because if they've modified the TCB, all bets are off. The best we can do is externally isolate them. But at least we know outside now. But we know there's been a successful attack. Yes. And, and here's the point is, again, if we were, if we were uh, air-gapped, we would not know. Okay. Since we actually have a communication path, we now know. And we know with 100% there's zero false positives, zero false negatives. This is cryptographic truth of what's going on in our systems. Uh, so you would be incentivized to restart your systems over. 
because uh, since you know you can uh, basically since your defense is applied persistence point, right? You know the attacker would want to use this connection uh, to compromise the running system, right? And you would want to uh, restart it periodically, right? Uh, to limit the time. Yeah, absolutely, yeah, well, wonderful point. So, and, and again, this depends on your threat environment. For for IMA and secure Linux, this was done as general work. Uh, so in some cases, I mean, in, in the normal uh, commercial world, I've seen in my entire lifetime two viruses that were actually true worms that never ever touched a persistent file. Mm -hmm. uh, even the original Morris worm was not actually touched a file. Mm -hmm. It actually coordinated with itself so it didn't over, overrun the, the local system with too many copies of itself. It had a synchronization file. That would be detected. But the sense that there have actually been two viruses that were completely 100% uh, process resident or memory resident. Uh, so it's very, very, very rare in, in the traditional world. Uh, in our critical infrastructure world, we're up against nation state hackers. They absolutely are going to try to do that. So, wasn't there a recent S7 worm presented at, like, at, at, like, at Asia uh, that basically used the uh, Siemens command set to both to basically propagate by up, by doing the firmware upload. There was yes yes sure. yes and, and that one um, again that was very very similar to what was done in the Ukraine uh, because this was a higher level control line <coughs> to a lower level controller the lower level controller assumed that it had. Um, uh, air gap defenses, and so it did no authentication whatsoever of the update. Mm -hmm. and, and so this was just a demonstration of that. But that was actually one of the key parts of the exploit in the Ukraine attack. Mm -hmm. So absolutely they can do that. Yeah, I'm sure. Uh, now, I'm it, well. it was, the, yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, we don't want that to happen with GE equipment. Uh, or all stuff equipment now, which is now GE. Um, but bear in mind, you know, all of those attacks would be stopped if that controller, the lower level controller, had a, TC, had a TPM, had the ability to attest, we would know what its firmware was. You know, and it really didn't matter how they got it there, we would know, and that would be a persistent attack. I don't know of anybody that's done an in-memory attack on a low level controller, but... Uh, I, but think, I think that word, that S7 word, which was just, just published, uh, included that on the S7 side, it probably did. I don't think it did on the low level. But anyway, right. we we have the engineering solution. I mean, right. we know what it is. Right. Put a hardware hardware root of trust, and we attest to that based on the hardware root of trust. I don't care what your device is. So one uh, and, and as long as I do reboot, yes. Uh -huh. Right. So one more question, if I may. Uh, so uh, that style of uh, uh, integrity checking would suggest also the programming style that enables continuous reboots. Yes. Right? And uh, that uh, presumes a, you know, that software engineers go along. Mm -hmm. Could you comment on that? I mean, can we persuade them to do it that way? Um, there are actually s some environments that they already do this. Um, in aviation, a lot of, uh, in fact, flight critical systems already do replicated voting type mechanisms. And when you have redundant replicating voting, it becomes actually pretty easy to do something like this. Um, the, uh, but there's nothing shipping right now that actually has integrated a security feature, a reboot feature with that. Mm -hmm. So there's still work to do. Uh, in the very old days, right, uh, on the list machine, you would easily reboot the world by just reloading it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Shouldn't we go back to that stuff? Uh, the problem, okay, and, and I go way back on symbolics machines. Thank you. So. <laughs> but um, the problem is that um, those machines, even with the hardware garbage collection, had this really nasty tendency of kind of stopping work for a while. And when I'm talking about these low-level control systems, we're talking microseconds, we can't actually even tolerate a, a, uh, a garbage collecting language. Now, higher level controllers we could, absolutely, and, and that makes sense. But these low level controllers, um, so they have to be hard real time. So Rust would seem to be a, uh, a useful absolutely target because it gives you control over your memory management yep. and uh, yep. higher level 
yep. objects. Which uh, that's a very interesting language, like, absolutely. But we're, let me kind of get oh, back. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> These are all, all very fascinating. Uh, so for time, I'm, I'm going to skip the demo uh, for now. And if we have time or people are still um, um, masochistic enough to stay around late, I can show it. But um, let me kind of tell you really where, where, the, the, where the things are right now. So again, I have to remind everybody this is not a product statement. I'm not allowed to give product statements. Um, <coughs> I can tell you what I'm doing in research. Okay, and in research, I happen to be working on one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight uh, hardware boxes. And by coincidence, all eight of these hardware boxes have hardware TPMs in them and have either secure and or trusted boot with them. Um, and, and I assure you that's entirely coincidence. Um, and so if, you, if we look at this, this wonderful matrix, a high-level matrix, you had, we talked about the different levels. Platform, the root of trust, so that's the secure, trusted, uh, protected boot. Uh, I mean, sorry, the root of trust of the TPM. Next level up is the, is the verified, measured, and trusted or protected boots. Uh, hypervisor, operating system, trusted. Now, on, on our products, we use a lot of different hypervisors and operating systems. Our reference right now is Linux. Um, we don't have some other operating systems are introducing some of these, and I can't tell you who and when. Um, but uh, you can imagine that there are a lot of the real-time operating systems out there, like Unix and VxWorks, and uh, some of the others just might be showing up in some of these great panels here in the future. Uh, I just can't make any statements about that. Um, secure communications, we're working on, we have to have certified crypto communication libraries. Um, and uh, OpenSSL doesn't meet the, the grade there because it's not properly certified. Hardly. Yeah. Wearable parsers. Yeah. It, so I mean, it's 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 a noble, wonderful open source thing, but but we have to have something that's you know cert certified. Uh, secure. So that's secure, secure communication, security services. This gets into PKI code signing. Um, attestation services uh, on the server side. Uh, uh, we're obviously working on all of these. Um, the next slide, uh, we're hoping in to have reference implementations of, all of these in research uh, by the end of next year. So that's kind of where we're at. There's a huge amount of degree in there, a huge amount of work to go on this entire stack. But it's a complete stack. It's hardware, hardware, uh, hardware slash firmware, operating system, networking, uh, and services. And we have to do all of them. And they all have to come back to this thing that they all have to report in. We have to measure their integrity continuously. Um, otherwise, we don't know when, not if, uh, they get attacked. Um, some of the gaps, I know that people are looking for projects. Uh, I actually do mention VxWorks and Cunix. Um, there are a lot of gaps in some of these things in terms of uh, one hot area right now that I'm very interested in is trusted containers. Um, one of the problems we have with our Linux reference IMA, the Integrity Measurement Architecture for Containers, is IMA it measures everything on the system. But if you have containers which come and go, and you run them for a while and throw it away, and another one comes down and runs for a while, we don't want all of those measurements continuing to be the the measurement, the one measurement list for the native system. We want actually this to be namespaced. We, we actually want to namespace IMA such that we can give each container its own reference. Um, and, and so there's a lot of work we need to do in there. Um, and, and some of the other operating systems don't even have mandatory access control. Uh, the other thing that's changing right now, and this is forced by NIST, is uh, TPM 1.0 series use uh, SHA-1 for their hash algorithm, mm -hmm. and everything's based on SHA-1. Now, the particular way that they're doing it in the extend operation, which is a hash of a hash chain, there's no, you know, even near practical attack. The birthday paradox <coughs> does not apply in those situations, but they still won't give it uh, uh, FIPS certification if we have SHA-1 anywhere in it. So we have to change the SHA-256 at least, um, even though there's not a practical attack. And so there's a new standard TPM 2.0 out there. Um, 
what we're doing now is we're putting chips in that can actually be upgraded from 1.2 to 2.0 uh, once that infrastructure gets in. But the software infra infrastructure for the 2.0 is quite a bit different than for the old one. And, and uh, so there's work to go on there. So we got a lot of check marks. We got a lot of in process. We got a lot of um, needs to be done. Thanks to fill in this graph, and that chart that we had. Uh, so a summary. Um, you know, this is the era. We have started the era of, uh, of nation state level cyber warfare. It's you know we crossed that threshold, and uh, we're firmly in that space now. For critical infrastructures, we've got to have um, secure, an entire secure stack, hardware, operating system, uh, network services, uh, and application. Uh, and that requires things like secure, trusted, encrypted boot, trusted operating system, trust services, and some way of collecting this and monitoring it remotely. We can't stay with these air-gapped existing systems. And there's a lot of work to make. And with that, questions? So I guess the remote attestation stuff, that has to reside on a hardware level, not on a software level, right? Where's that? Uh, so remote attestation requires a combination of hardware and software. So we have a TPM on the client. The TPM device actually has this, this hash of all the hashes in it. Um, and it can sign that hash. Now you have to have some software that does not have to be trusted on your client to take that signature at the list and send it up to the attestation service. The attestation service then looks at the list and validates that the list matches the signature from the hardware TPM. And that tells them that nobody has tampered with it, you know, nothing in between. Um, then it looks at the entire list and has to say, is this good or bad? Now the list could be, you know, hopefully what we want to do with IMA is we want signatures in there. Because with signatures, all I need is like the root GE key. So how does that stop a replay attack? Uh, it doesn't. Okay. Okay. There are several different complementary things you can do for replay attacks. Mm -hmm. um, in our case, if something is signed, mm -hmm. you know, in general, the simple evaluator will just say it's signed, that's good. You can have a more complex database in which you revoke hashes, even if they are signed, where you can actually do key updating. So if you update, if you do an update, you know, for simple embedded system, you might get away with, you know, if you update it every six months, you just have a new key. And you and you throw out the old public key for validation and use only the new one. I mean, there's a lot of different ways you can play that. You can even have a complete hash a database of all the hashes, although we actually tried that once in the early IMA days. And we filled up, a, um, our database became, it was like 40 gigabytes, and we had only done one version of Fedora at the time. <laughs> and we looked at that and said, you know, it is changing constantly. You know, every day there are changes. So building a hash database is, is just not tractable. So that's where you really want to go with signatures. So if you want to prevent replay, you either have to roll your keys uh, frequently enough or at some periodicity, or keep an exception list of known bad, you know, hashes or something like that, and, yeah, and just not accept them. You, so your attestation end would have to be more complex. Okay. Uh, oh, I shouldn't <coughs> jump in unless there are other questions. Oh, okay. Seem to be Dr. Reeves. Uh, so you mentioned that the, a lot of your, your, your trusted boot and your secure boot are all based kind of on hardware um, solutions. What sort of what sort of hardware protections do you have in place for 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 that sort of uh, to, to make sure that the hardware is still trustworthy? Oh, okay. Uh, um, you're not asking what the hardware mechanisms are. You're asking why would I trust the hardware mechanisms? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's okay. Uh, I mean, perfectly valid question. Um, uh, if I'm sure everybody, I don't know if everybody's familiar with these wonderful competitions. There's the underhanded. You know, okay. There's the obfuscated C comp competition that everybody's seen. There's an underhanded C competition. I don't know if you've seen that. The idea is to make code look innocent but be malicious. And those things have been amazing how you can, can, can you know, work on the corners of the language and, and, and interfaces and APIs and things like that and make malicious code look innocent. At the same time, you can do the same thing with VHDL. 
exactly the same thing. And there actually was, for a couple of years, an underhanded VHDL programming competition. And it was scary because they take what looks like, you know, you can look at it, a small snippet of VHDL, and it looks good and it's, and it's malicious. Um, and that's assuming you can even look at VHDL. So, I mean, absolutely right. You, you know, where do you stop regressing in, in, in your security solution? And particularly when we're talking about nation states. Because what is, you know, um, I should have had a quote. I have another slide that has a wonderful quote from uh, a security report that the, that the government did. It was a President's Critical Infrastructure Protection uh, Committee report. Um, and it was wonderful, because they had a paragraph in here saying, well, you know, a nation state can do all this <coughs> list of nasty things. And the list was really long. It was like a self-admission saying, yeah, we do all these things. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 and some of the things they had in there are just you know, kind of mind-boggling. We, uh, we place employees at critical uh, companies, like hardware companies, and we put back orders in the product. So, and this was actually printed by the U.S. government. Okay, and, and it went on. The list was, was amazing. So, when you have those kind of resources, you're absolutely right. How do you do? You know, it, it's like crypto. In some sense, well, yes, this is provably secure as long as you trust the underlying, you know, per cache is perfect. You know, you do what you can. So, as long as the TPM chip is correct, all of this works. Okay, that's as good as we can do right now. Uh, I would love to have, you know, there have been other projects, Trusted Foundries and some other things, and, and actually some of the things that used to be attack technologies like RF analysis, that they actually turned to say, can I identify any backdoors and chips? And, and the, the, the end result is, well, kind of no. <laughs> <laughs> because you know, there are just so, so many wonderful ways to hide these, hide these things. Um, I actually gave a talk at the NSA on this subject, and uh, my favorite analysis was was uh, Sam King was giving his talk. His talk was on uh, undetectable crypto backdoors, and by his point, uh, undetectable was that crypto protected. So in other words, you had to have a 256-bit key to trigger the backdoor, and if you didn't have that, the backdoor is completely undetectable. So you can never ever see it in any chip testing. You know, within the lifetime of the universe. So um, I said, yeah, well, that's great, but I know that people don't test these chips exhaustively. You can't. And all you need to do is just have one, disconnect one wire. The one output of the signature check on, you know, like Intel and AMD both sign their, their microcode. If you just, you know, invert that logic, what's the chance that somebody's actually going to try an in illegal piece of microcode that's badly signed to see if it fails. <laughs> Do you think Intel's actually done that? I bet they haven't. I certainly never have, because I can't, the, the microcode's not documented. Nobody can, you know, it's really hard. Even the NSA was having a hard time injecting microcode. So, um, yeah, I mean, they're, yeah, it's, it's a scary world. And, and right now what we can say is if the TPM is correct, then this follows. You were mentioning that you were going to have a 2.0 version of firmware and upgrade the old one. If the chip's firmware can be upgraded, what prevents a malicious person from upgrading the firmware to some, whatever they want? Excellent question. Thank you. All of this depends on your threat model. Okay. And what we're doing with these control systems is we don't want the Russians or the Chinese or whoever coming in across the network and reprogramming our system without us knowing it. To do the firmware reprogramming, you actually have to physically touch the system and put additional connections on to the SPI hardware chip to reprogram it. And that, that's our threat model. And if they can get to that, then, then it's like if they can get to the chip itself, we're still stuck. For the, like every verification that you're running through the cloud or you're logging onto the cloud, does it for every executable that I run, do you log everything onto the cloud, or is it every once in a in a while that you're logging the thing onto the free cloud? I mean, you can do this any way you want to. The, the underlying mechanism doesn't really care. In my demo, what I'm doing is, in real time, if a new file has been evaluated, so my list has been extended, I push it up to the cloud for it to see. Okay. 
you could you could do it other ways. You know, you could you could, um, and and that's fine for control systems, which don't really aren't, aren't supposed to change very frequently. Um, but you can also do pulls. You can do periodic pulls and, and pull it from from the cloud. You know, it's. it's it's very flexible as to how you want to implement. I think. Can you just like, what if I can block the communication between uh, between the controller and the internet? Like, will you at some point realize that there is no communication oh, coming oh, from the same? Oh, certainly. So I mean, that I, I just kind of mentioned that before. I mean, I can completely compromise the operating system. You know, wipe the disk, load my own version of Linux in there. Don't have any encryption, none of the stuff. Um, the point is that I would have to block the communication from the TPM to the attestation cloud. Otherwise, the, you know, the jig would be up. They, they would tell that I'm not running the authorized software. So I would have to stop it. And so yes, you need to have you know, a, a heartbeat type of polling mechanism that says, I haven't heard from him in, <coughs> in, in an hour. You know, what's, what's up? But that's, that's you know, Predix has a, a lot of, of built-in type of functionality for routine streaming of data. And, and looking for um, period, periodic data while pushing and pulling. So I mean that's very easy. Do you expect that the ideas to be developed with a very specific set of hardware and transmission of information model to ever be driven down into consumer electronics and protect my Facebook account and things like that? Uh, well, a lot of the technology <coughs> was originally designed for those other environments and already is going out there. Um, this has been in work for a long time. <coughs> in the Linux community, that's one of the things. It has to be general purpose. It has to work for everything from embedded through supercomputers, you know, and, and everything in between. Your, uh, a lot of this was led by cell phone industry. Uh, you talk about locked bootloaders, the cell phone industry pioneered that and made it, you know, and I'll, they've done it too much because they lock it so even the physical possessor of it can't change it, you know. In our case, our threat model is if I can touch it, I am the owner and I can change things. Um, so it's, it's however you want to do it, but a lot of this was led from consumer industry. Is your temporal granularity of your heartbeat a vulnerability? Yes. Okay. Um, the question is, you know, and that ultimately gets to how, in, in, in the case of Ukraine, for example, they were, they had compromised those, those devices for six months prior to the actual attack. Yeah. Okay. And um, uh, while it's possible, certainly, that they could do it, you know, break in and destroy that one device immediately, that's counterproductive to them because now I got alert from one site and I tell everybody else, here's a signature, you know, batten the hatches, batten down the hatches, you know, let's uh, lock things up until we get, you know, some firewall signatures in and, and, and you know, stop that particular attack, F figure out what the underlying vulnerability is, put some patches out, and then we can resume our behavior. Mm -hmm. So activating that quickly would actually is a problem for the attacker. Yep. <coughs> So the idea here, I guess, from GE's side, is to drive the replacement cycle in controllers. So everybody gets these sort of controllers. How does this work in terms of the, how much replacement do you need in a particular site to gain meaningful security? Overall, oh, okay, so that's, or? such a wonderful question. Um, the, there are a couple different business cases. Okay. There, there's a technical case and there's a business case. Um, one business case is we make all of our new things secure and then we hope to sell a lot of them because they're better than the competition. There's not a lot of, of money in the replacement. On the other hand, there is money in services of servicing existing equipment and if this lowers our cost by making it more robust, then it makes sense for us to do it. On behalf of UGE, on behalf GE, of GE, right? Yeah, and, and and there's every model in between. Almost all of the uh, wind turbines are actually run on that model. They're essentially leased, and <coughs> GE is on the hook for repairs. So it makes sense for us to go back and so get those. An attack is a liability for GE, yes. not for the yes. Field in, in a lot of cases, I mean, like wind, this is very common. Mm -hmm. I mean. 
I'm not, I'm not a business case expert. I'm not a sales you know type. I, I've gotten this as requirements from some of the other groups, so I know a little bit about it. But I know there are lots of different financial models. Pretty much every one you can possibly imagine is probably out there somewhere. So uh, there has been a conversation about software liability. You're saying that essentially the lease models in the larger equipment market, at least, it is happening uh, by itself. Oh gosh, I'm, I'm, okay, so I'm not a lawyer. I've not seen the contracts. I don't know exactly what's covered and what's not. But, but certainly, if it hurts our customers, you know, it's something that that uh, that would hurt us in some way. And I don't know exactly how, but you know, it's whether it's market share or actual dollars, and, and so we want to avoid that. Um, I have one more question. Yeah, I have before. Okay, so one last question. <laughs> uh, so then, um, this style of development with uh, universal signing of things, and presumably with the signing of modules that somewhere the level as well. How much of a drag is this on the actual uh, programming, on the actual development? Oh, okay, uh, a, a very good question. Um, the, in, in our top line, one of the network services is actually code signing, and um, we actually have a wonderful solution for that. And we've actually been working on integrating it with the development environments that we're looking at. So uh, a lot of our embedded controllers use either, uh, typically use something like Yocto Linux. Um, and we actually have code signing integrated into that development environment. So you push the button, it just automatically happens. Um, and, and we have this tied into corporate, what they call HSMs, hardware security modules. In other words, the code signing keys are in hardware cards, not unlike 4765, um, which the private key is protected by hardware and never leaves. And so basically the hash of the code goes to them, it's signed in this protected environment and the signature comes back. So this is a very, very strongly you know, protected and, and a well understood thing of how to integrate. So then uh, the sort of the attack surface comes to include the developers. Uh, no, it doesn't actually. Uh, okay. We have, with, this, with the signing service, um, we have developer signing service, so all the development rounds go through that. And then it's handed off to a separate production, which has a different key hierarchy kept in, in uh, the HSM, and they sign it with an actual set of production keys. So, uh, yes, you trust the developers because they can put bad code in there, right. but, but their signatures that they put on never go out in the field. And are never trusted in the field. But you still put them through the steps because yes. this is important. Yes, because you <coughs> want to test out of it, other than the actual key. The, if you look at, 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 at Chrome development, they actually have done all of this, and it's in, they have developer keys uh, built in, and they have have production keys, and and you know it's a fairly well understood, reasonably well solved thing, and uh, you know. We're, we're taking advantage of a lot of the work that's already been done there in, in existing HSM uh, code signing services. Okay. Thank you.